Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar on Alpha Poll, what's in it for me? My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'm your host for this webinar. This webinar is part of a series where we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear from local or international experts who present on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help you achieve your best biomedical, agricultural and environmental research. You can keep up to date with the latest news and events from Australian Biocommons by following us on Twitter or by subscribing to our newsletter. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today, we're joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people in Mianjin or Brisbane, and the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations in Melbourne. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Craig Morton to share his perspectives on the implications of AlphaFold for science and for structural biology. Craig is the drug discovery lead at the CSIRO and has many decades of experience in drug discovery in academia and in industry. He has a particular interest in anti-infective agents for viral diseases and bacterial diseases with a focus on protein structure function, protein modeling, protein ligand interactions and computational small molecule drug discovery. He's an early adopter of AlphaFold and I'm very much looking forward to hearing his thoughts on how it can be used for better or for worse. Welcome to the webinar, Craig. I'm now going to hand this over to you to start your presentation. Thank you very much, Melissa. Okay, hello everyone. So yes, AlphaFold, what's in it for me? First of all, uh, a very brief disclaimer. As Melissa's mentioned, I'm a structural biologist with an interest in protein structure function and computational drug design. I'm not an AI expert, machine learning expert. So I'm coming to AlphaFold as a user rather than a, a deep understanding of how it works. I will, however, go into a, a user's level of understanding of how AlphaFold functions as part of the presentation. But if you really want to understand the nitty gritty of AlphaFold, then I suggest you read the papers and specifically the supplement to the papers that have come out on AlphaFold. So what's AlphaFold? Well, back in 2021, everyone got very excited. There were publications, newspapers, all sorts of comments everywhere about this new thing, AlphaFold 2, claiming that a major problem in biomedical science had been solved, the protein folding problem. So what were they exactly excited about? They were excited about an article that had just come out and results that had happened at a protein prediction uh, competition, CASP. So this is the paper, highly accurate structure prediction with AlphaFold. And the reason people were excited was basically this little graph here. So CASP is the Community uh, Assessment of Structure Prediction, a competition that's held every couple of years where a series of structures that have been solved recently but not published, the sequences for those proteins are released to the public. And anyone who wants to can try and model those proteins, not knowing what their structures are. Those structures are then compared to the actual unpublished crystallographic structures. And the quality of the fit between the model structure and the actual structure is used to see how well people are going with their predictions. Now, the normal sort of success measured by the RMSD, the mean squared deviation of the backbone atoms for the model versus the actual experimental structure, comes in around this level of around three angstroms, saying you, which normally tells you you've got roughly the fold for the protein correct, the shape of the protein, but the details are lacking. Then there was alpha fold two. Here's the result for alpha fold two, averaged across all the predictions for CASP. Less than an angstrom RMSD. This basically means they're within experimental error. Here's an example of in blue, an alpha fold predicted structure, and green, 
a crystal structure from that CASP competition with an RMSD between them of 0.8 angstroms. Effectively, the structures are identical. And so that's what everyone got excited about, the ability to take sequences and get the three-dimensional structure of the protein correct to within effectively experimental error. Now, for a long time, people had known that you know, the sequence of the amino acids in a protein chain implies the three-dimensional fold of the protein. So all the protein has is that sequence of amino acids and the physicochemical environment that it finds itself, normally water with various salts and things in it. The protein undergoes a folding process that collapses through some semi-folded intermediates to a final metal, metastable folded structure. And that, that structure gives the protein its function and roles. And back in the 70s, Chris Leventhal came up with the, the protein folding paradox, now known as Leventhal's paradox. How does a protein sample the available conformational space in a physiologically relevant time scale? So if you think about a protein chain, the number of degrees of freedom at each point, the ways it can fold up are enormous. And if each protein had to sample every possible shape before it ended up in the correct folded shape, proteins would never exist. They'd never be able to fold up into their useful final stable state. So somehow proteins go from an unfolded state as they're produced on the ribosome to a folded state in a, a very short time scale. Now we can understand that this is happening because of physics. There are all sorts of interactions that occur between adjacent amino acids, between the amino acids and the environment they find themselves in that drive the transition through this unstable intermediate state to the final folded state. But modeling that, understanding that the details of that process was incredibly difficult. So when you sequence implied fold, but how you got from sequence to fold was something we just could not model. That's where alpha folds come, come in. So how does alpha fold work? Now I'll just comment that I've taken several images in the next few slides from a presentation by Sergei from the, the collab fold team, because they've done such a good job in analyzing alpha fold that it seemed a waste of time to me taking all their slides and then remaking them myself. So if you want to see more pres of their presentation, go to their GitHub link. Uh, they have their slides all listed there. So how does AlphaFold work? So back in 2014, with the CASP11, so the same protein prediction uh, competition, uh, a typical pipeline looked like this. You take your sequence, you look against a sequence database and make a multiple sequence alignment for all the sequences that lined up with your sequence you were trying to model. Then you did various clever things with it. You did position-specific position scoring where you looked at what residues lined up with each other. And you used various computational analyses to predict what contacts may exist between amino acids remote from each other in the sequences. You took this analysis of the position-specific position scoring matrix and used it to predict secondary structures, to search through databases of known structures to find fragments that contain those structures. And you also looked in the PDB for a possible template molecules that were similar enough to your initial sequence that you could use them for template-based modeling. And you would then combine those bits of information, the contact maps and the fragments, to do a folding-based prediction, free modeling effectively, and a template-based modeling where there were protein templates that were close enough combined again with fragmental data to try and hybridize that to again, model the three-dimensional coordinates of your protein. So that was back in 2014. In 2018, at CASP 13, the first iteration of AlphaFold, which is now AlphaFold 1, came along. It wasn't totally different from the older approaches. You had your sequence, you did your alignments, you took that multiple sequence alignment, you extracted information from that, again, with position-specific scoring matrices and so on. Then you passed it through a deep learning module. The deep learning module predicted the distances between various residues, not just contacts, but distances, and the dihedral angles of the backbone of the protein for every residue. On the side, you also do a fragment database check, looking for fragments that will give you a little bit more structural information. 
alpha fold one would then combine that dihedral and distance information and the fragment information to generate final structures. And it did reasonably well, not vastly better than other approaches, but quite well. But then in 2020, CASP 14, AlphaFold 2 came along. AlphaFold 2 in some ways is a, a simpler process. Again, sequence is taken, sequence databases are analyzed, a multiple sequence alignment is created. Position specific scoring matrices are then measured. The PDB is searched and templates are found if any templates exist. Then the sequence alignment and information if possible from templates is fed into the first deep learning module, the EVOFORMA. This outputs us an initial set of X, Y, Z coordinates, which feed into another deep learning module, the structure module. That takes that initial guess, refines it, and puts out a final structure. But the secret to AlphaFold 2 was a critical detail. And that critical detail is recycling. The insight they had was that you could take your initial guesses from your first pass through the system and feed them back as additional information into the whole uh, pipeline. So the first pass through the system spits out a set of coordinates which feed back are a recycled through the whole modeling process. And it's this recycling that allows AlphaFold 2 to be so successful. Recycling is really important in this case. So here is a made up protein. These are de novo designed transmembrane beta barrels that were published by a group uh, in science. So these sequences don't exist in biology. These are sequences that this group created designed to be transmembrane beta barrels and solved the structures to demonstrate that they had been able to design effectively foldable sequences that made a beta barrel. If you look at the output from each cycle through AlphaFold trying to predict the structure of those beta barrels, you can see that the best guess through the first cycle has some beta structures in it, but isn't properly folded. And as you step through each cycle, the details improve and you end up finally after five cycles with exactly the beta barrel structure that you expected. And you can see this, oh, sorry, and that's an overlay of the AlphaFold prediction on the experimental structure for that particular beta barrel. And you can animate this. You can see as you're going through the cycles of prediction using the AlphaFold 2 pipeline, the quality of the structure improves over time. This is colored both by end to C terminus here, so you can see the path through the protein, and by the quality score, the PLDDT, that comes out of AlphaFold. So recycling, this process of feeding the structure that you initially predict back through the whole pipeline is the secret to AlphaFold 2's success. So now we know recycling is important. How does AlphaFold actually work in detail? Well, if you go to the AlphaFold 2 paper, they have all these nice diagrams that explain everything. And particularly the supplement, the AlphaFold 2 paper, the Jumper et al. Nature paper, there's an enormous amount of information about the details of how this works. Now, I'm going to step through this at a relatively high level because, as I said, I'm not an AI machine learning expert. But let's look at this figure that explains overall the process through AlphaFold 2. So it takes an input sequence. It does a database search and finds a multiple sequence alignment for your sequence against every other sequence it can find from every species. So orthologs, quite happy. It also looks at residue pairing. By residue pairing, it means information about interactions between residues within the sequence. It starts off with no information. And so it builds a, a very simple matrix of residues plus or minus, I think it's 30 residues from each point have an interaction score because they're close to each other in the sequence. That gives you a pairing matrix. That matrix will be evolved over time with information that's generated through the process. Of course, you also always do your structural database search to see if there is structural information and templates out there that will give you more information about uh, interactions in space between different residues. That sequence information and pairing information are turned into a sequence representation and pairing representation 
that feed into the first of the deep learning blocks, the Evo former. That spits out a modified sequence representation and a modified pairing representation, which provides more information about the way the residues pack in space. And that is fed into the structure module, which generates a three-dimensional map, the three-dimensional coordinates for a protein. Of course, that information is fed back and recycled through the Evo form and structure module uh, by default three times. So what happens in the Evo former and structure modules, these deep learning modules? Now, first of all, a word about AI and machine learning and deep learning. Again, my understanding of these things is not super deep and technical. But here is my sort of take on the difference between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. So with artificial intelligence, basically you're letting the machine do all the work, but you've come up with the rules the machine's going to use. So let's say you're, you're trying to get an artificial intelligence that can distinguish between pictures of cats and dogs. You've sat down and looked at lots of pictures of cats and dogs and said, okay, dogs, if there's a ball in the picture and it's in the animal's mouth, well, that's going to be a dog. If it's got its tail and pointy ears sticking up, it could be either, but it's probably a dog. If it's killing a mouse, it's probably a cat. So you've come up with all these bits of information that are your ideas for what matters. You set those up as a bunch of yes, no questions that the computer can answer. And it then looks at pictures and does that all really, really quickly. So you've come up with rules and the artificial intelligence is applying them. In machine learning, you change the, the rules slightly. You say, okay, computer, here's the rules I've come up with. And now here's a whole lot of training data. It's pictures of cats and pictures of dogs and I've labeled which one's which. I want you to now go through, take all my rules and adjust their importance depending on how well they help you predict the training data. So the machine learning is taking the rules you've come up with, but it's getting better at applying them by adjusting the weights of those various rules. And then there's deep learning. Deep learning is the, the mysterious one where not only does the computer change the weights of the rules, but it comes up with the rules in the first place. So for deep learning, you don't tell it, okay, here are pictures of cats and dogs and here are the rules I think you need to apply. You just give it lots and lots of pictures of cats and dogs labeled as cat or dog and let it figure out what it thinks are the rules that matter. So here the computer is not only doing the work, it's working out how to do the work. This deep learning side of things is what's been applied in the Evo former and in the structure module. So let's look at the Evo former. So as I said, the Evo former is taking your multiple structure alignment and your pairwise representation, and then applying a bunch of internal an analyses of that information to improve the output structure represent uh, sequence representation and the output pair representation. Again, if you want the details of what all these steps are, you'll need to go and read the paper. I'm not going to go into them in detail, and I don't necessarily understand them in detail. As a user, you don't have to worry about really what's going on inside this box. What they say in the paper is it's to view the prediction of protein structures as a graph inference problem in 3D space in which the edges of the graph are defined by residues and proximity. So basically, it's turning pairwise representation information that you've generated from either the sequence itself or from templates and the sequence analysis into information about how close residues are in three-dimensional space. The structure module then takes that pair information and what it knows about the structure of backbones in proteins and it predicts the position of the backbone triad, the nitrogen carbon carbon backbone of each amino acid relative to the adjacent ones. So it's not predicting their three-dimensional position, it's predicting the relative rotation and translation of the backbone of each amino acid in the sequence with respect to the one before and after it. And it spits those out and at the same time builds the position of the rest of the residues if those backbone positions are correct. So that generates the three-dimensional structure of your mo molecule. 
Of course, it then takes all that information and feeds it back through. That iteration then occurs multiple times. And you can understand how having a guess at the structure may improve the pairwise representation. In building the position of the backbone of all the residues and then the position of all the, the residues, you get a fold for the molecule. And this will allow residues that are distance in sequence to become closer to each other in space, which is information that you may not have been able to derive earlier on from your pairwise representation. But having an initial guess that tells you a little bit more about the distances between the residues means you can refine your model and rebuild your model. So what's important when you're putting sequences in, what's going to make it work better or worse? The whole alpha fold 2 process is highly reliant on the quality of your multiple sequence alignment. If you can't find good matches for your sequence in the database, it's not going to work. And that's because the sequence analysis, where you're looking for co-evolution of residues, when residue 1 and residue 20 always change together in every sequence where you've found a sequence alignment match, that tells you something, that those residues may not be exactly interacting with each other, but they've got some impact on each other. So the mutation at one site affects the position, the, the nature of the residue at the other site. If you can't get a good set of this sort of data, AlphaFold2 won't work. So very unusual structures won't work in AlphaFold2. Now, this is commented on within the paper. And this is also an interesting point about interpreting the neural network. These deep learning modules are to a degree black boxes. The computing process, the training process, has built a set of rules that the computer then uses to analyze new data. It's not always obvious what those rules are, extracting what the rules are. So having explainable deep learning is an art in and of itself. And if you read this quote from the paper, they tell you some useful stuff about the sequence alignment analysis that they've got. The model uses multiple sequence alignments actually decreases substantially if the median alignment depth, so the number of sequences that match well, is less than around 30 sequences. We also observe a threshold effect where improvements in depth over about 100 sequences leads to small gains. So there comes a point over 100 sequences where adding a few more sequences to the sequence alignment doesn't really help. We hypothesize, and I've underlined that bit, that the MSA information is needed to coarsely find the correct structure within the early stages, but refinement does not depend crucially on the MSA information. So they don't know for certain. The guys who wrote AlphaFold2 and published the paper don't know exactly how the sequence alignment data is handled. They've got some feel that it needs to be 30 sequences and over 100 sequences doesn't seem to matter, but they don't know exactly what happens with the sequences inside the system. So AlphaFold doesn't just predict single proteins. It's perfectly capable of predicting multiple protein-protein interactions as well. And a variant of AlphaFold trained specifically to do this better, AlphaFold Multima, is available as well. Uh, the paper for that is only in BioArchive still. It hasn't actually come out in uh, a proper journal. And AlphaFold Multima uh, does an amazing good job of predicting dimers, trimers, all sorts of things, peptide-protein complexes. And people discovered this early on when AlphaFold2 first came out. They would just build long sequences consisting of two monomers joined by a set of glycines and to see how well it would fold them up as a dimer. And it did a pretty good job back then. AlphaFold Multima has been optimized to do that even better. So if you want to predict uh, monomeric proteins or multimeric proteins, AlphaFold2 can do it. But next question clearly is how do I access it? Where do I get hold of AlphaFold? Well, you can download and install AlphaFold itself on your home computer. I wouldn't recommend doing that. It requires a lot of computational grunt. The best thing to do is to make sure that your institution where you work has access to high performance computing and get them to install AlphaFold there. You can just download the, the AlphaFold predicted structure for pretty much any protein these days. So there's a library, AlphaFold EBI at ac.uk where you can search for Uniprot sequences and find the predicted AlphaFold model for them. You can also, of course, access it on Galaxy. 
our fault has been available on Galaxy for just over a year now. And I believe Galaxy 23 was released yesterday. So the latest version of Galaxy is out there. You can access it there. Uh, there's a reasonable number of GPU clusters available to power it, which it does need. I'm not sure of the total capacity, but um, I'm sure that information is available on the Galaxy website. There's a modified version of AlphaFold called CollabFold available online. So there's the, the link to the CollabFold GitHub. Now, CollabFold takes a short step with sequence alignment. It uses its own special process for rapidly aligning sequences. So it's somewhat faster than AlphaFold, though slightly less accurate. But if you've only got a couple of sequences to, to, to model, I would recommend trying CollabFold first. So this is the CollabFold interface. It's just a notebook online. You simply put your sequence in, give it a name, and hit go. And away it runs on uh, CollabFold com computational resources at Google. If you want to do a single sequence, you just enter the sequence. Series of residues, just paste it in there. If you want to do a multima, a dimer, for example, you put the sequence once with a colon and then the sequence again, and it will model your dimer for you. If it's a heterodimer, just put your sequence with the colon and the second sequence. So CollabFold's quick, easy to access. If you only have a few structures you want to play with, it's worth using. There is a resource limitation. It won't do very large sequences. And if you use it too often, it'll kick you out and say you're using up too much resource. You can, of course, install CollabFold locally. So you can have this, in, for in, this simple interface for AlphaFold on your own hardware, your own servers, by going to that GitHub location and downloading and installing it. The advantages of a local CollabFold is there is no timeout, which you can get through the, the Google clusters that you access. There are no GPU limitations. It uses whatever hardware you have. And it's upgraded to the latest version. Google also offer a version. So Google being the parent company for DeepMind, who came up with AlphaFold, they've implemented a highly parallelized CPU GPU optimized version of AlphaFold 2 that is very, very fast, can handle very, very large sequences. 3,000 plus residues are not a problem. And it does it by splitting up the job in, in multiple different ways that most people are unable to do. And because it can split it up in so many ways and you can use their Vertex AI pipelining uh, interface to see how it, it does all this, all the predictions happen simultaneously in parallel. It's extremely quick. It does, however, cost money. So you'll have to make it, have a relationship with um, Google and uh, you'll be paying. It turns out for the very large proteins we tried, it was a couple of hundred dollars uh, for the compute time. Okay, so what does all this mean for structural biology? We can now predict proteins really quickly. They seem to be quite accurate. Is that any good for us? Well, let's, let's look at a test case. So I'm quite interested in Alzheimer's disease. It's an area I've been working in for a while. And we've been looking at this protein, amyloid precursor protein. Now, our interest in amyloid precursor protein is this little peptide, the transmembrane peptide. So the transmembrane peptide in amyloid precursor protein is the one that forms these fibrils, aggregates that precipitate in the brain and form, form amyloid plaques, the characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Now we know the structure of chunks of this protein. We did experimental structures of these two N-terminal domains that form what's now called the E1 unit. There's experimental structures for the Kunitz protease domain. We've done structures of the E2 domain, which is this helical um, section. There's a lot known about the structure of the transmembrane A beta peptide that forms the fibrils. There are sequences between. This is an acid-rich region, which we don't expect to have a lot of structure. There's a long region between the Kunitz domain and the E2 domain, and there's another region between the E2 domain and the membrane, all of which don't have predicted structures. To understand what APP does, what APP's actual role is, we need to know a lot more about the structure. So let's use AlphaFold to have a look at it. So you can just download, of course, the amyloid precursor protein structure from the AlphaFold database. It's already been modeled, and there's the image of it there. If we zoom in on that, you can see the model. Now, it doesn't look terribly useful. They're these long, big loops. There's the bits we recognize, the E2 domain, the E1 domain, the Kunitz protease domain, uh, protease inhibitor domain. And that's probably the transmembrane peptide. And that's where we run into a problem. Just because AlphaFold can spit out a structure doesn't mean you can interpret it directly in the context of function. And that's a universal problem with structures. 
how do we go from the three-dimensional structure of a protein, and I can even show you its cofactor bound into the uh, adjacent to the active site. How do we get from this to its role in biochemistry? Now, I can tell you that it's this little piece of biochemistry down here. That protein was alcohol dehydrogenase. But that's because I knew that. Giving you that structure it is very difficult to work out what that enzyme does. Having a structure without a lot of the background biochemistry isn't terribly useful. We need experimental evidence for what the protein does, what ligands it has, modifications that occur post-translationally, whether it forms complexes. And so when we build an alpha-fold model, we should be refining that on the basis of this experimental data. So again, let's look at the context of APP. There's the APP model, and that's the sequence for amyloid beta precursor protein. So I can take that and I can, rather than using the uh, EBI database, I can build my own alpha-fold model. Looks pretty similar. Things are slightly packed differently, but no major differences. But I know a lot about this protein. I know that there's a signal sequence at the start. Well, we don't really need that in the model, but there it is. I know that there's the cytoplasmic domain and the transmembrane piece. Well, they're important probably in its function, but when I'm trying to understand the role, the, the, the function of the extracellular domain to the protein, that whole piece of the structure can be discarded. There's a long sequence between the well-defined structure of the, the E2 domain and the membrane. Well, that's probably not that important either. And you can see that it's been very poorly predicted by AlphaFold. And there's this piece in the middle between the E1 domain and the, the Kuhnitz protease domain, full of glutamic and uh, aspartic acids and threonines and serines. We expect this acid rich region to be unstructured. It's over there. So we could take that out as well. We could ignore those pieces of the sequence. The other thing we know is that APP forms dimers. So let's model it as a dimer with those bits missing. So there it is superimposed on the original full length model as a monomer. We throw it away and there we've got a dimer that contains all the pieces we know are well-structured, packed together. But that's the second model that I generated for that because AlphaFold generates you normally five models. It's packed completely differently. Which one's right? I've got no idea. Again, I need more information about the actual function and biochemistry of the protein to build these models, to understand them. I know that the E2 domain binds heparin and zinc. That needs to be modeled in properly before any of these models are usable. So just because you've got a structure out of AlphaFold doesn't mean you're gonna be able to interpret it in the context of function. That requires an understanding of the biochemistry of your protein. So have we solved the protein folding problem? We can go from an unfolded chain to a folded protein now. But AlphaFold goes straight across. It jumps from an unfolded chain to a folded structure. It tells you nothing about the actual process by which a protein really folds up. So the protein folding problem has not been solved. We don't know the details of how proteins fold. However, we can now go from the unfolded state to the folded state. So we've got an answer to part of the problem, but this piece of the puzzle is still missing. So I bagged AlphaFold a little bit there, but I still think it's great. What's in it for me? Well, it generates really rapidly accurate models for potential drug targets. So big transmembrane proteins, it might not do a brilliant job on, but small globular proteins, enzymes and so on, it's really very good. And I can use them for virtual screening, for docking compounds, for mapping functional data onto structures if I didn't have a structure. It gives me models from molecular replacement, which I'll come to in a bit more detail in a second. And it helps me complete experimental structures because when you build structures experimentally, you're often missing loops or you have regions where the electron density is poor. So you know the protein's there, but it's very hard to build. AlphaFold can help fix that. So let's talk briefly about molecular replacement. So when you're doing crystallography, a big issue is you shine your X-rays through your crystals, they scatter, you measure, the position of the, the scattered X-rays and their intensities, but the phase information is lost. You somehow have to then convert those amplitudes and intensities to a three-dimensional structure, the electron density that tells the atomic positions. And you have to do that without the phases. 
And it turns out phases are terribly important. If we take a duck and a cat and we effectively do diffraction of them, we take their Fourier transform, we have intensity and phase information in a new space. Now, if we combine the phase information from the cat and the intensity and position information from the duck, we get this map here, and we reverse that process, we end up with a noisy cat. The duck is almost completely lost. Most of the information in your diffraction experiments comes from the phases. And so solving that phase problem is a huge thing about in crystallography. Molecular replacement is one way we can do that. If we have a quality model of the protein, if we have a structure prediction for the protein or a, a homologue for the protein, where we know that the structure is going to be quite similar, we can use that packing it into what we know the crystallographic space to be from this electron density amplitude map. And we can guess what the phases would be and use that to back calculate what the density was. And that works remarkably well. And of course, one of the first things people started doing with the models that we're getting from AlphaFold was using it to phase data that they'd never been able to phase before, getting solutions using an AlphaFold model because the models coming out of AlphaFold for the structures were good enough that you could do that. Now, it doesn't always work. This is an actual problem that we were trying to solve. Here is an AlphaFold model for a particular bacterial toxin we were looking at. And here is our final structure that we had to solve using traditional approaches for the same protein. And you can see there is a difference between the two. If you superimpose the N-terminal domain, it superimposes quite well, as does the C-terminal domain. But the overall fold of the protein is different. The packing has changed either due to effects within the crystal, or perhaps the protein has more than one structure and AlphaFold's only predicted one of them. So we weren't able to use AlphaFold to solve that structure, even though it predicted a fold that was reasonably similar. So you have to be cautious when you're using our fold for molecular replacement. What else have I used it for? Well, the obvious thing is the speed of structure prediction. I was working on a family of pore forming proteins, a new family of things that we'd identified. They had very minimum, minimal sequence identity to themselves or other proteins other than a particular motif which we'd identified. And there were about 300 sequences. It had taken us two years to experimentally solve two structures. So here is uh, one of the toxins we started with, and we use information about this to search for others. One of the structures we got has a related fold, but different enough that uh, you couldn't predict it normally. This is my experimental structure for the protein. AlphaFold predicted all 362 sequences we'd found in 12 days. This was when AlphaFold had only been out for a little while, and I set this up and ran them all through. So that's about 11,000 times faster at getting the structures. It also did an amazingly good job of predicting the fold of this C-terminal domain. This domain, if we zoom in on it, had a novel fold. When I searched for this fold in Dahlia, a database of protein folds, I couldn't find a representation for it. That's the alpha fold model for the, that part of the sequence. Remarkably good match. And of course, where I had missing loops due to packing effects within the crystal, alpha fold predicts everything. So alpha fold not only predicts the, the fold completely accurately as far as we can tell, but fills in missing loops for us. The other thing we know about these toxins is they ligramize into pores. So I gave alpha fold a trimeter model. And then once it had built the trimer, it extended it by superimposition. AlphaFold knew nothing about this poor form of the protein that it formed these large multimers. But the model it built, I could extend round and it made an almost perfect, slightly out of alignment, 33-ma loop. So the structures you can get out of AlphaFold can give you information amazingly accurately. Now, one thing that's happened since AlphaFold came out was that it sort of opened the floodgates, showing that deep learning modules could do amazing things with protein sequences has triggered a whole lot of other results. And the first one, of course, was RosettaFold. RosettaFold came out from David Baker's group after they'd seen how well 
uh, DeepMind had done at the CASP 14 structure prediction with AlphaFold 2. So looking at the things that have been mentioned by DeepMind at the time, they built their own structure prediction module. It works in a different way, but it comes almost as uh, close in accurately predicting protein structures. And since then, a whole lot of other things have come out. OpenFold now exists. OpenFold is a, a recoding independently of AlphaFold 2. With everything available to you, you can retrain it yourself. You can see all the bells and whistles going on inside. And you can go to their GitHub website. You can download out OpenFold and retrain it yourself and get effectively the same results as AlphaFold. It's somewhat faster. You can do longer chains because they've changed the way it handles memory so they can get up to 4,000 residues on a, a single A100 GPU. There are all sorts of advantages in using AlphaFold over using AlphaFold 2. But again, it only came out because AlphaFold 2 was published. As well as those sequence alignment based uh, approaches, there are now language models where you just take the sequence of amino acids and on the basis of the order of the amino acids, you can predict three-dimensional structures. So there's ESM, which does a remarkably good job of predicting three-dimensional structure purely from sequence without doing any sequence alignments. And there's Omega Fold, which does the same thing. High resolution de novo structure prediction from the primary sequence. Just a language model with geo and structure formers. And you can see that because it doesn't require um, sequence alignments, it's vastly faster. It takes a lot, less, so down here runtime is seven seconds versus 227 seconds versus alpha fold two. And there are all sorts of other papers coming out, different ways you can use AlphaFold for all sorts of aspects of understanding protein structure and function. So AlphaFold now has somewhere close to 5,000 citations. If you search for AlphaFold in PubMed, you come up with about 500 different papers where AlphaFold's either in the title or the abstract. And there are things like AlphaFold where they are trying to fix some of the issues with AlphaFold, that AlphaFold doesn't include ligands and cofactors. And then AlphaFold's becoming part of pipelines. So there's this amazing paper, again, from the Baker Group, which uses AlphaFold as part of its protein structure prediction, where you say, OK, I want a pentameric uh, symmetrical structure with this sequence. Please tweak it so it will fold. And it goes through an iterative function of analyzing how those things would fold, including alpha fold as part of the process, to produce large protein assemblies. And these are the experimental cryo-EM data for these imagined, hallucinated, as they call it, protein assembly sequences. And not only can they assemble these uh, multimeric complexes, but they have RF diffusion, where you can take another protein, a ligand, anything you like, and you can say, OK, I would like to build a protein that will bind to it. RF diffusion will fold out of space a new sequence that fits to your target of interest. And it uses as part of that pipeline, AlphaFold. So what can we say about AlphaFold 2 in summary? Well, it's a deep learning approach to predict the three-dimensional structure of a protein from its sequence, but it does not solve the protein folding problem. That's still a problem we haven't got an answer to. It's highly reliant on large-scale sequence alignments, and that gives pairwise information that allows it to predict the fold of proteins. It will predict monomers and multiples at very high quality, which are good enough for most purposes. They're as good as experimental structures a lot of the time. There are some targets that it doesn't do particularly well, transmembrane proteins, large multimeric complexes. But still, it's amazingly good for what it does. And the different applications, different ways of using the data that comes out of AlphaFold have been published continuously. But my take home message, the one thing I want you to keep in mind is that your AI generated protein model is only as useful as your functional and biochemical understanding of the protein. Just because you can get a model out of AlphaFold doesn't mean you suddenly know everything about your target. What matters is your biochemical understanding. The structure just gives you a framework to interpret 
that understanding. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Craig, for that fascinating look into AlphaFold, how it works, what you can use it for, and most importantly, what you can't use it for. We have time now for questions. So Craig, if you have a question, please write that into the Q&A box. I'll give you a moment or two to think of your questions. In the meantime, we have a couple of pre-submitted ones that I can start with. So Craig, what's your feeling? Is, is this really a paradigm shift for structural biology or is it just an incremental improvement? I think it is a paradigm shift, but with caveats. So the caveats I've already mentioned, that the functional information is what matters. Having a structure is a framework to interpret your functional information. But the fact that we can now, for most proteins, go from a sequence to a pretty accurate, nearly as good as experimental data fold for that molecule to give us that framework to start is, yeah, that is a paradigm shift. Okay, so we can move now to questions that are coming in live from the audience. The first question I'm going to ask is, do you know of any good uh, training I'm presuming training on how to use AlphaFold or example workflows online. Again, I would go to the Colab Fold uh, GitHub. They've got a lot of discussion there. It's not terribly difficult to use. It really is. You give it a sequence and the structure comes back. Uh, the hard thing is interpreting that structure down the line. So if you have relatively simple globular proteins you wish to model, I'd recommend going somewhere like Collabfold or the Galaxy instance and putting the sequence in. That's really all you have to do. You don't need to tweak anything. You don't need to tune any of the parameters. The default settings for AlphaFold to work for pretty much every structure. So this then ties quite well into the next question is, how often would you tend to alter the default number of recycles when running AlphaFold to? Sounds like from what you're saying, not meant much. Not often, no. Uh, when the discussion about recycles first came out, everyone was playing around with them. Uh, I haven't found an occasion where altering the recycle number made a substantial difference to my problems. <clears throat> I guess it's always going to be problem specific, sequence specific, the sort of protein you're trying to model. Some of them it'll be easy and the standard number of re uh, recycles will be enough. Some of them maybe adding a couple of recycles will be necessary. You can change that setting in pretty much every uh, instance of AlphaFold I've ever played with. Feel free to do so, um, but I'd be very interested to, to hear of specific examples where it was necessary. Thanks, Craig. So this question is coming in thick and fast now. I'll see if I can keep up with them. The next one is, uh, there was an upper limit of predicted protein sizes of around 3,000 amino acids. Is that still current? Uh, no. So you can go higher on, say, the Google instance because they've designed the, uh, the workflows differently so that the, it can handle a large number of residues than that. And some of the newer things like uh, some of the, the language-based ones, ESM fold and Omega fold can handle larger sequences, I think. And OpenFold can go to about 4,000 on standard hardware because uh, they've tuned the way it uses memory. So they're, they're slightly less demanding on the memory than the, the standard um, AlphaFold model. So you can get up to four, four and a half thousand residues uh, now. I'm not a protein biologist, but that sounds like a lot of residues to be put. It is a lot of residues, but if you're trying to build multiple systems, that yeah. can be the issue rather than single proteins that big. Though there are proteins that size. Oh, wonderful. That sounds really exciting. Um, okay, so next up we have, does it matter uh, if you reduce the inference time further using HPC optimized code like FastFold? It... I, okay, again, slightly out of my expertise. I, I think the answer is no, we, again, with the caveat that your accuracy will probably drop a bit. It's, it's that trade-off between compute time and accuracy. If you want the best accuracy, then you use all the bells and whistles. 
but the difference between the best AlphaFold 2 model with all the bells and whistles and something with a, a slightly compacted like a collab fold approach or something where they've changed the way they do the sequence alignments to make it faster. Usually the difference is not significant. Um, the difference between your structure and the best possible structure and an experimental structure, you might actually be closer to the experimental structure than the best alpha fold two model, simply because of the variance between the, the, the different approaches. So again, it's, a, it's almost a suck it and see thing. You try what you've got available. If you are compute resource limited or you need to do things quickly, you, you tweak things to make them run faster. If you have the luxury of being able to just use the CPUs and GPUs to your heart's content, then go full bore and, and use the full tools. Thank you. The next question is, you emphasize that the AlphaFold result is still within the limit of biochemical understanding. What's your opinion on the protein-protein interaction from AlphaFold predicted structure? I think the multimers, you know, if you use AlphaFold multimer to predict a dimer or a multimer, you know, heterodimers, homodimers, the results for anything I've looked at where I knew what the actual structures were have been perfect. It does a really, really good job of predicting those interfaces. So the ones I've looked at have all been ones where it's a definitive protein-protein complex that forms and is stable biochemically. If you were looking at transient interactions, so proteins that associate and stick to each other in quotes, but do so in a, a defined way, but it's not a permanent interaction. They don't hang around together as a dimer, a heterodimer. I'm not sure if it does quite as good a job, but again, this is a problem I haven't explored. So yeah, my interpretation is that using AlphaFold Multima to build dimers and heterodimers is as good as any other approach for doing protein-protein interaction modeling. Thanks. So then moving on to another question again, is you talked about look, quite a number of different models of AlphaFold or different applications of it. Do you have a favorite one that you prioritize? If I'm in a hurry, I tend to use CollabFold because it's very easy to just drop the sequence in there, hit go, the website sits there running in background and you can keep eyeballing it to see if a structure is coming out. Um, but at CSRO, we have our own instances set up. So one of my collaborators, Mike Kuiper, has, has set up a thing he's called AlphaFold Factory. You have a subdirectory called Inbox. You just drop a faster file in there and hit go. And the program looks to see if there's a sequence in the inbox. If there is, it models it, puts it in the outbox. And you can just keep dropping sequences in the inbox and it will just keep modeling them for you. So there's no real thought required. Um, it's very, very easy to use. So again, I think all the instances I've played with of AlphaFold, uh, what helps is a nice front end, something that makes it easy for you to just put a sequence in and hit go. The first time I was using it uh, at my last position at Melbourne University, we had it installed on a supercomputer Spartan. It did a great job, but it was inside a singularity container and it had all this long command line interface and it wasn't trivial to use. So finding a version where you've got a nice interface would make a big difference. Galaxy would be an obvious choice as well. Galaxy has got a nice interface for you know, handling all this. You don't have to understand all the the detailed command line stuff that goes in behind the uh, scenes, you can just put your, your sequence in and the structure comes back to you. That's a really good point. As well as the ease of use, are there um, there's certain flavors like the Rosetta or AFT that are more suited to different types of questions that you're probing? Not to my knowledge. I think they all are trying to answer the same sort of thing. No one's tuned a model to my knowledge for a very specific purpose. They're all trying to be generalist, that they will predict from a sequence, a structure, uh, from a sequence from a heteroma, the heterodimeric structure, et cetera. So I haven't used anything that hasn't been generalized. And they're all trying to do the same thing as generalized tools. There may be specific, you know, more specific tools out there. I, I'm not on top of the, the 5,000 papers that reference AlphaFold or the 500 odd ones that come up in PubMed. 
it's just really hard to keep on top of the amount of literature that's coming out. Yes, it definitely sounds like a moving feast. So the, the best recommendation Constantly. there might be to, well, this might sound a bit flippant, but Google it, see what's yeah. happening for your particular question with Applefold. You know, Ask like, chat GPT, I'm sure it knows. It might, it might. We'll see. Um, we've got time for one more question. I'm not sure this is actually one that you can answer from your use. Mm -hmm. um, it is how often or likely do you need to retrain the model? Or sorry, pre-train, re-pre-train the model. I've never attempted to train AlphaFold myself. So AlphaFold comes trained uh, and the training data isn't available. It's a trained model that you get when you install the software. The other ones like OpenFold, you can train. They come with training data and you can use that or you can use your own training data. You can tweak the training data. So I've never attempted to retrain one of these models. Uh, for my purposes, it's not necessary. The models work for the sorts of things I need to do. So yeah, I can't really comment on, on how hard it is to do that yourself. The training, however, is going to be the really computationally expensive part. When building the models, churns up a few CPU, GPU hours, but the training process tunes up thousands of hours. So keep that in mind. Yeah, it sounds like this is more about uh, using it more at the biology end rather than building the model itself. You, you're trusting the model to, to do the structure. Yes. Yeah. I know I said that was the last question, but there's a really good one that's just come in oh, that I want to yeah. ask. Um, and it is, is it okay just to use AlphaFold results in your manuscript without backing that up with actual protein crystallization data? Okay, that is a really good question. And I think yes, uh, as long as you're upfront about it and say that it's an alpha fold model and it's been used as a model for interpreting purposes. Because I've published several papers in the past using models that I've generated with things like Modeler or Swiss Model. And as long as you say that it's a model that came from model or a Swiss model, everyone understands what it is. So if you've got an AlphaFold model and it's giving you useful insights into your functional data, I don't think there's any problem with you saying, I generated a model using AlphaFold. Uh, here it is and here's what we're learning from it. Okay, thank you so much. We are going to have to leave it there for today. I know there's a few more questions that we didn't get to, but I'm hoping that... Craig's presentation and the discussion has given you some inspiration. So as we leave today, I just have a couple of things to remind you about. So as you have heard, this webinar is part of a series that we do. And over the next couple of months, we have a wide variety of different workshops and webinars coming up. We'll also be getting out and about to some conferences that are happening in Brisbane. We have the Galaxy Community Conference and we'll be down in Melbourne as well for the International Congress on Genetics in July. Uh, you can read all about what we're getting up to by having a look at our website. You can also follow us on Twitter. We're at Commons or sign up for our newsletter. You can also catch up on recordings of previous webinars on our YouTube channel. Uh, the last thing to say is I'd like to acknowledge that Australian BioCommons is enabled by ANCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. So thank you so much again, Craig, for sharing your time with us today and your story of using AlphaFold. And thank you to everyone for joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed it and we hope to see you again soon. Until then, have a lovely day and goodbye for now.